Moving on to early experiments to characterize the atom. So there, there's this model out, you know, Dalton's Dalton's model of the of the atom. Um, but again, we have to, we have to quantify our understanding of the atom. So uh, based on the work of uh, Dalton, Gay-Lussac, and Avogadro, and some others, chemistry was uh, really beginning to make sense. Even if you disagree, ha ha ha! What a good joint. Um, and the concept of the atom was clearly making sense. It, 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 was, it was helpful. It was predicting, uh, you know, phenomenon that weren't understood uh, up until that point. So it was just working out real well. Uh, but again, there's other stuff going on there. So let's figure out what that other stuff is. Uh, first, let's talk about the um, description of the electron. So J.J. Thompson, you know, that's not a, a, a typo. There's no P there. That's actually a very English name, Thompson. Um, he, and he was actually a, a very big big deal. He actually ended up winning a uh, Nobel Prize in physics. His son even uh, went on to uh, win Nobel Prize uh, in physics. I believe it f was for working with the wave-like particles of electrons. I could be wrong on that, but I, I believe that's what it was. But they're one of the only uh, father-son uh, pairs uh, to each win their own uh, um, Nobel Prize. I, I think it's happened once before, but again, I, I could be wrong on that. Uh, but anywho, John Thompson found that when a high voltage was applied to an evacuated cu or cube tube, a ray, which is what he called, um, he called it a cathode ray, uh, since it came out of the, the negative electrode or cathode, um, when you apply voltage across it was produced. So when he put this high voltage through an evacuated tube, um, he noticed that a cathode ray, and he, just, he called it a cathode ray because it was a ray, which is a beam, uh, as far as he could see, uh, that e e uh, emerged from the cathode, and that's, that's the negative electrode, uh, when he applied voltage to it. And uh, you'll see when we get into the electrochemistry uh, chapter that this almost seems backwards because uh, we're going to be dealing with, with batteries and how batteries generate electrical current. And there, there's, a, there's a key difference here, so hopefully this won't confuse you or if you have any experience with, you know, knowing what a, a battery does, if you've done that in a science project before. Um, you probably think of the cathode as the uh, the positive end. That's only when you are inside the battery, right? Inside the battery, where the chemistry is actually happening, right? So, and, and we'll see this when we actually get into those galvanic and voltaic cells, we're going to see that the cathode is actually uh, the, the positive electrode. And one of the ways that we remember that is when we write cathode, right? The T in cathode looks like a positive sign. But this is not the battery. This is not inside the battery. This is not producing the electric current. Notice that when you apply a voltage across it, so the voltage has already been created. This is not the battery. In that situation, we flip the polarity. We flip which end is uh, positive and which end is uh, negative. Now, you might not know enough about batteries to have that even confuse you. Uh, but if, if it is, I just wanted to uh, deal with that real quick. <coughs> and so we have this negative cathode, which means this is where the electrons are coming from. The electrons are coming in this way. This is the direction uh, of the electrical flow, and then it goes that way towards the positively charged electrode, which in this case would be the anode, right? See this positive over here? And obviously that's the way that an electron would move, right? From the negative to the positive, right? Because the negatives attract. So now the ray, the ray was produced at the negative end. It was repelled by a negative pull of an applied electrical field. So what happens is um, the electrons, or should I say at this point, the ray is moving from this plate to this plate successfully, and it closes the circuit. Everybody's happy. But when we add essentially magnets, right, this top one being the, uh, the, uh, the positive field, the bottom one being the negative field, there's a deflection, right? There's a deflection. These ray, this ray was repelled by the negative side and attracted to the positive side, and you can see that the ray bends up away from the negative towards the positive because of this deflection away from the negative and towards the positive uh thompson postulated th that the ray whatever it was was a stream of negative particles now um he postulated they were particles because they had mass if you guys remember there was a pinwheel 
um, that kind of looked like the the paddle on a, a steamboat or uh, yeah, old old river boat like a, a Tom Sawyer days, and the 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 wheel would actually move across um, uh, the cathode ray. And so it was, it was definitely had mass, and so we called them particles. And it was definitely negatively charged because it was um, deflected away from the negative and towards the positive. Uh, Thompson then went on to measure, to measure the deflection, the extent of the deflection uh, of the beam of electrons, and he was able to determine the charge to mass ratio, right? And so when you take the charge and divide it by the mass, you get a value. Now, there's there's a formatting error. This should look like this. 1.76 times 10 to the 8th coulombs per gram. Okay, sorry, this, this, this should be right there. A little formatting error. Hope that doesn't freak you out. And so uh, the coulomb is the fundamental unit of charge. Right? So it's 1.76 times 10 to the 8th coulombs per gram. So if you had a gram of electrons you would have a huge amount of charge, a huge amount of charge. That's times 10 to the 8th. Um, so <coughs> the electron is charge, is the charge on the electron in, uh, in Coulomb, right? Or sorry, I say E, I'm sorry. E is the charge on the electron in Coulombs. M is its mass. Thompson discovered that he could repeat this deflection and calculate uh, using electrodes of different metals that all metals contained electrons and all atoms contained electrons. Right, and so what this what this means was the original metal that he observed this in wasn't the only thing that had that created this cathode ray, this ray. Uh, you know, he would try it with copper, he would try it with zinc, he would try it with aluminum, he'd try it with gold. Maybe not gold; gold's expensive. But he would throw all these different types of metal in there, and he would see that this ray would be produced. And so that led him to conclude that all metals contained electrons. Right, this ray of negatively charged particles. And by the way, he just gave, instead of calling it a cathode ray, he named the individual negative particles, he named them electrons. And from that, we get that all atoms ba -boo, ba -boo, contain electrons. All atoms contain electrons. Furthermore, uh, all atoms uh, were neutral, and there must be some charge within the atom, um, and therefore the plum pudding model was born. So... Thompson, when he created his plum pudding model, which is pictured over here, he knew what the source of the negative charge was. It was the electrons. Now, he had no idea what the source of the positive charge was. He had, had no clue. He just knew that there must be a positive charge somewhere because it was known that all atoms were neutral. Right? They, it, was, it was clear. It was easy to demonstrate that all atoms were neutral. They didn't have a positive or negative charge. And so if a part of the electron had a negative charge, then there must be another part of the atom that provided the positive charge to balance that out. Now, uh, he didn't know what it was, and so he just, again, went with Dalton's idea of just kind of a sphere for the atom, and he would place the electrons kind of evenly distributed throughout this, uh, this positively charged matrix, this like stuff in here that just all had this diffuse positive charge. Um, and he called it the plum pudding model. Now, don't let that, you know, throw you off because you, the English, any dessert is essentially called pudding, right? So this would be a little bit closer to in uh, uh, our American terms, like a blueberry muffin, right? So like the blueberries would be the electrons and the rest of the muffin, the bread, would be the, uh, the diffuse positive charge. Uh uh, moving on, the other one that uh, we want to work with here and uh, understand um, is that Robert Millikan in the early 20th century uh, did some work, and he it's called the oil drop experiment. What he would do is he would spray charged oil drops. Okay, so uh, we would start with this atomizer, which if this looks familiar, doesn't this look like an old timey um, perfume sprayer? How you would like spray the air? You know, I have this this rubber ball, and you have this liquid, and it would just kind of turn it into a spray instead of a liquid. Well, that's, that's what an atomizer is. It turns it into small chunks. All right, so it's a spray. And so, <coughs> uh, okay, so we have the spray. And, you know, oil has mass, and so it's going to be accelerated downwards due to gravity. And there was just a very, very, very small opening uh, for the oil to move down. Right, so only a only a small amount of oil, as you know, there there's in spray particle form. There's spray; it would settle down nice and slowly. But 
as it went down through that hole, there was an x-ray machine that was zapping these oil particles and it ionized them. It created a charge on them. So remember when you uh, apply a significant amount of energy to a particular system, you have a chance to ionize it. You have a chance to move those electrons out of the atomic system and leaving it with a charge. So now that they're charged, right, now that they're charged, Millikan ran um, a, a current through these two plates. He made one of them positive, one of them negative, right? They were electrically charged plates. And what he would do is that he would adjust the, the, uh, uh, the charge, the positive charge, and then adjust the negative charge, uh, the strength of them, until these oil droplets would actually levitate in place, meaning the um, attraction to the positive plate, the repulsion from the negative plate, they were in such perfect balance that they didn't move anywhere, right? They were in perfect balance. And so he used uh, that information from the amount of voltage that he had to apply to these plates <coughs> to calculate the charge on the oil drop itself. Remember, he was charging these oil droplets using x-rays. He just didn't know what the charge was, right? He would use this balance between a voltage that he knew, right? Because he put the, the voltage to these two plates. He used the, uh, the voltage on these two plates to figure out the voltage that was on, or sorry, the charge uh, on this thing that he didn't know. Um, and using that, he was also able to calculate the mass of the electron. Because if we're overcoming the acceleration due to gravity, you know, minus 9.81 uh, meters per second squared, being able to halt that acceleration and keep it exactly still is also going to give you the mass of that particular object. So he was also able to come up with the mass. Now, because of that, if you put the mass in, right, because we already knew the charge to mass ratio, if we're able to determine the mass of the electron, which is right here, plug that in here, we can actually solve for the charge. So now we know the charge of an individual electron and the mass of an individual electron. And thus, the electron was successfully identified.